Thank you, Paul. Good morning. Um, I will move more to the clinical aspect of milk protein. And my talk is all around what are we doing right when we feed our infants and what goes wrong when we have this outcome and all our efforts must be towards that this doesn't happen. I will talk first about data in the general population on obesity and animal protein intake, then I move to the childhood population, obesity trends and milk intake, and then I move to the first thousand days, talking about risk factors for later obesity and higher body fatness, and I will talk about inadequate high protein intake with milk and how to prevent this. First, the general population, we have now 604 million adults who have a body mass index about uh, 30 and above. And uh, two months ago, there was a big study coming out showing which food categories play a role in obesity. Because we are not eating sugar, we are not eating fat, we are eating food. And this is much more important than focusing on single categories of nutrients. This systematic review was published by Schlesinger in Advances of Nutrition. And I show you only two charts uh, which are related to animal protein. The first one is fish protein. Um, fish protein, of course, uh, when you eat fish, it has a good effect. Uh, it lowers the risk of obesity, but only to a certain amount, uh, up to 40 to 60 grams per day, and then the curve is flat. But the results are highly significant. Risk ratio uh, is 0.75. On the other hand, the usual suspect, red meat, which we like also very much, uh, you can see, the more we eat, it's not so good for obesity. The risk is increasing. Risk ratio is 1.18. So these two animal proteins have, uh, uh, when eaten as part of food, a clear effect. Let's move to milk. Uh, intake of milk and dairy products uh, and risk of overweight and obesity. And you can see here, uh, the x-axis shows how, many, how much milk people are uh, drinking and how many milk products are they consuming. And it's very clear that we don't consume too much. A baby is also consuming 600 milliliters. So it would be very surprising if this has a big effect on uh, obesity. And indeed, the curve is flat. It is parallel to the x-axis and milk intake has no effect on obesity risk, at least in adults. Move to the childhood population. First, to obesity trends. This, you know, and worldwide the prevalence of overweight and obesity combined rose by 27.5% for adults, but 47.1% for children between 1980 and 2013. So the risk is increasing and it's not over. In the US, the, during the recent years, it was always advocated, oh, this obesity trend has stopped. It's, uh, the situation is not good, but it's no more progressing. But recent data published in November 2018 from the US show another picture. Here, uh, the prevalence of overweight and obesity one to three between, 1000, uh, between the 1,999 and 2,060 is indicated. The NHANES, this is a population census uh, between 1999 and 2016, 
is indicated, percentage of overweight as defined as 85% and above body mass index, obesity 1, 95%, obesity 2, 120%, and obesity 3, 140%. And you see, it's all increasing, it's not over. Uh, overweight from 28.8 to 35.1, and even the severe obesity, the real uh, sick uh, people, uh, are increasing a lot. And there was an editorial in the same uh, pediatrics uh, journal, and it can be summarized, 35 years with bad news, it's not over. Obesity prevalence continues upwards, and this is true for most countries in the world. Racial and ethnic factors are important. Poverty. In the U.S., obesity is a disease of poor people. The data predict that the majority of two-year-olds today will be obese at 35 years, which has an impact on life expectancy and the costs the burden to the healthcare system. And the battle of obesity against obesity once it's here, no magic bullet. So we come to the third point. Is it relevant also in Europe, where as begun is? And you can see uh, in some countries, mainly Eastern Europe, the prevalence of overweight and obesity is already 25 to 30 uh, percent, also in the southern part of Europe and here in the UK. Is milk intake a factor of childhood obesity? This study was published in April by Kang and co-workers. The effect of milk and milk product consumption on weight gain and body composition among children and adolescents aged 6 to 18 years. It's a meta-analysis, 17 trials have been included, and 2,844 uh, children were followed. Uh, and the intervention was always milk and dairy products more than 12 weeks versus no milk and dairy products. Primary outcomes were weight gain and change in body composition. And the outcomes were, if you drink milk, you have more rapid weight gain, it's significant, but the weight gain is fat-free mass. These are muscles, bones, and uh, visceral organs, not fat, because it also shows that the percentage of uh, body fat is going down in the infants and uh, in the children who are receiving milk. So we can summarize, milk and dairy product consumption, we have better weight gain, but we have less body fat. Now we move to the first thousand days. First thousand days are extremely important uh, because of uh, programming, the, of preventive aspects, and I like very much this uh, cartoon which has been published by Stolz Consulfes uh, also recently and showing how programming takes place. First we have the genes which move into a black box which is called epigenetics and this box is responsible whether genes are expressed or are quiet, silent. And in this black box, there are a lot of factors like diet, environmental factors, but also the microbiota, which are important, and out comes our programmed genes, our tailor-made genes, and if the right genes are expressed, we are healthy. If the wrong genes are expressed, we have a risk to become obese and have other diseases. So this programming is important in the first thousand days. What are the risk factors uh, for growth and development? Uh, first, maternal overweight and obesity. 
Then it always has been discussed. Caesarean section is it a factor? And high milk protein intake during the first two years. Maternal overweight, the prevalence is increasing between 1980 to 2013 from 29.8 to 38%. So if maternal overweight is a risk, it is a problem for the offspring. And our data clearly show uh, when we make a correlation between the BMI of the mother on the x-axis and the BMI 60 months later of the offspring, there's a clear relationship. When the mother is in a normal range, it's not so dramatic, but if the mother, for example, has a body mass index of 35, then the body mass index of the offspring is much, much higher. And what we can see here, the difference is 2.1 uh, uh, grams per square meter, which is substantial just the factor maternal obesity is considered, and 20% of the variation of BMI at 60 months is explained by this. Why is maternal obesity a risk factor? Well, uh, it has to do with the father and the mother, the genes and the programming of their genes. Weight gain during pregnancy is uh, faster, higher risk of gestational diabetes, more insulin is produced during the interuterine growth, higher birth weight and BMI, and the family eating habits continue, which made father and mother a little bit overweight. And a lot of uh, studies are published in the last five years about microbiota transfer from the parents to the infants. Is cesarean uh, section a risk factor for late obesity? Also here it was uh, very unclear, but we have clarity now. The Cork study uh, published uh, in 2019 followed uh, body mass index after vaginal delivery. These are the blue and caesarean delivery, these are the red lines, and you can see uh, caesarean section has no effect on later overweight and obesity, uh, both the mean and the 95th confidence level of the mean are overlapping. Now, milk protein. Why? Would high milk protein intake of infants and toddlers have an influence on later obesity development? Well, milk protein is the dominant protein source. Between zero and six months, 100% of the protein comes from milk. And this is much more important than during later childhood and adulthood. An excess of growth driving insulinogenic amino acids provided by high intakes of unmodified milk protein activates growth and stimulates growth uh, hormones uh, such as IGF-1 and uh, insulin, and this results in accelerated weight and fat gain. Data from which have been already addressed by uh, Taga. Um, the protein in breast milk is rapidly decreasing. We have it here between birth and 12 months. And it's mainly whey proteins, which are immunoprotective, which are secreted at the beginning. But then from one to four months, uh, the protein content is much lower than in our textbooks, and it's even lower uh, in the second half of the first year and in the second year. When we uh, feed our infants follow-up formulas from six months onwards, uh, up to three times the amount of protein is consumed. This has been uh, summarized by an expert group led by Bert Koletsko in the Annals Nutrition and Metabolism 2015. 
And when we are feeding our infant cow's milk from nine months onwards, you see the protein intake is far in excess. So when we learn from breast milk, we have to summarize protein concentration is rapidly decreasing during lactation and not all protein fractions in breast milk are important for growth. Higher prevalence of childhood obesity in non-breastfed infants has been documented during the last 25 years. These were mainly cohort studies. Uh, one was uh, 1999, uh, uh, looking, looking at uh, obesity of Bavarian school children, and the other one is the Elant study in France, uh, uh, which followed uh, a, a cohort of French newborns up to 20 years, and it's very clear that the amount of protein which is taken has, is strongly associated with obesity later in life. But on the randomized controlled trials, which compare high and low protein intake uh, with formulas can prove whether protein intake is responsible. And we have two trials now with long-term follow-up and body composition data. First, let's start up uh, intervention during the first four months, high versus low protein formulas. And these uh, interventions have been summarized by Alexander in, two, in 2016. It's a meta-analysis uh, of 17 trials with one low protein infant formula, 1.8 grams per 100 calories, whey-based formula, and this indicates that the weight of infants fed low protein formulas corresponds to the WHO standard. Both the 50 percentile and the variance is very similar to breastfed infants at four months. However, infants fed higher protein formulas had significantly higher weight at four months than the WHO standard. So there is an effect from the first day on life onwards, it's important what we are doing during the first few months, and they will come back later. Randomized control trials during the first year to prove causality that low protein intake prevents from accelerated growth. The two studies all included breastfed infants, infants on low protein formula, and infants on high-protein formula. You can see this is, the, uh, this is the study design. The infants also always received during the first four months the same formula, 1.8 grams. Then they were switched to a higher and lower protein formula. There were three trials which have been followed up and these three trials in him, uh, stopped intervention at 12 months of age. Weight gain during the first year. This is the daily weight gain of breastfed infants, of low protein formula and high protein formula infants. And the high protein formulas uh, infants have higher weight gain significantly higher than low-protein formula infants and breastfed infants. This is the CHOP study, the second study, which followed uh, infants until six years. The CHOP trial is a multicenter European trial uh, coordinated by Bert Koletsko. And <clears throat> you can see three cohorts. The red line is the high-protein Forward. The uh, blue line is low protein, and uh, the green one is breastfed infants. We have body mass index here, and you can see there's a difference in body mass index during the period of intervention. This was the first year. Here you have a difference, 
and this difference persists. And at six years of age, uh, there's a significant difference between the cohorts. Low protein and breastfed infants have a very similar body mass index, but the body mass index of high protein for molecular kids is significantly higher. However, weight gain and body mass index are poor indicators of body fatness. Therefore, longitudinal follow-up of body composition, for example, fat gain, body fatness measurements, are necessary to document the potential long-term risks of early nutrition and development of obesity. In that context, a study of Elizabeth Forsum published in March 2019 is very important. This has nothing to do with feeding, but it's on tracking of body fatness. In this study, they used the pea pot and the pot pot to measure body composition at 1 and 12 weeks and at 4 years later. So the kids were followed longitudinally. And the primary outcome was is body composition in infants, infancy at 1 and 12 weeks associated with body composition at 4 years. And this study shows the body fatness at 4 years is strongly associated with fat gain 1 to 12 weeks. Remember, the first 3 to 4 months are also important. Unfortunately, with the peapod, you cannot measure body composition at six to nine months because the infants are a little bit restless and you cannot always have precise outcome measurements. I am sure uh, it would also be very valid if you would say uh, fat gain between uh, the first, uh, during the first six months is associated with body fatness at four years. So body fatness tracks. Fat gain, early fat gain is important for later fatness. And the second data set is there's a strong association of body fatness at four years with fatness at 12 weeks, but not at one week. So what we are doing during the first months is important. If the kids are increasing their body fat, they have higher body fat content at four years. And the study shows uh, the association with 12 weeks, with four years, it's significant both for boys and girls. So with this data in mind, we go back now to the two longitudinal studies, first to our studies, and I have to show you the dynamics of body fatness first. The percent body fat increases from 15% to 25% during the first six months. Dramatic change. But then it decreases from 25% to 80% uh, between six months and 16 months. This is a dramatic change in the body composition. Now, when we look at this period, 6 to 16 months, minus 8% should be the reference. What we did in a subsample of our three studies in the American cohort, we did DEXA measurements, and you can see now what happened. The body fatness decreased by 7.3%, is almost exactly what the reference should be. If the infants had low protein formula, 4.9%. If the infants had high protein formula, minus 2%. And there's a significant difference between this group and these two groups. So early nutrition has a long-term effect on body fatness. And similarly, the JOB study published in 2018 data on skin fold thickness, fat mass index, and risk of excess body fat at two, five, and six years. And you can see, if you give high protein formulas, 
the sum of skin folds is higher, fat mass index is higher, and the risk of excess body fat is significantly higher. Also of interest is they have measured, this is in the lowest line, the preperitoneal fat with ultrasound, which is an indicator of visceral fat, as they say, and it was significantly higher in the high protein group. So there are consistent changes in body composition due to the intervention in the first year of life. Published also in April 2019 uh, uh, is a meta-analysis whether uh, complementary feeding is a risk factor for later obesity. And to summarize, moderate evidence suggests that the first introduction of any complementary foods and beverages between four to five months when compared to introduction at six months is not associated with weight status, body composition, body circumferences, weight or length among general healthy term infants. Limited evidence, however, suggests that introducing complementary foods and beverages before four months of age may be associated with higher odds of overweight obesity. Last intervention is also a very recent one. It's an intervention during the second year of life where we always give cow's milk to infants because we consider there is no risk. This study has been done in New Zealand and Australia, published by Wall and co-workers in two study sites. It was a randomized controlled trial where toddlers at 12 months were enrolled into the uh, study and then followed up to uh, 24 months. Same amount of kids in, in, uh, received cow's milk or a young child formula with low protein content, which we previously called growing up milk. The primary outcome was body composition. So you can see that the infants, uh, the children, the toddlers received 300 milliliters of milk per day. And this is the protein concentration in cow's milk. And this is the low, uh, the young child uh, formula. When we look at the protein intake in re relation to the requirements as defined by WHO and FAO, this is the cow's milk group. You can see almost the protein requirements are covered by these 300 milliliters of milk. And there is no room for the rest. Whereas with a low young child formula, low protein, there is some space for protein intake with a complementary feeding. And indeed, uh, the outcome was body composition. You can see the cow's milk group had significantly higher uh, percent body fat than the young child formula group. This is significant. And the amount of fat in kilograms was half a kilo uh, more in the cow's milk base group, just by giving two, giving two different types of milk. Take home message, nutrition and obesity. The obesity pandemic is not over. In children, adolescents and adults, consumption of milk products is not associated with obesity and high fat gain. Obesity during pregnancy is associated with childhood obesity. Caesarean section is not associated with obesity. Now we come to the infants, the first thousand days, and uh, the World Breastfeeding Week makes it very clear what infants should get. From randomized control trials, there's evidence that high protein intake during the first two years, in particular with old infant and follow-up formulas and with cow's milk, results in higher body mass index and increased body fatness which is now documented until five to six years. We should promote breastfeeding beyond six months because it provides the right amount of protein. If breastfeeding is too short, 
we should recommend modern low-protein infant follow-up and now also young child formulas. If you want to read more, you can uh, I refer to the to an expert group which published uh, they, uh, uh, an opinion on nutrition during pregnancy, lactation and early childhood, and its implications for maternal and long-term child health. It's published in the Analysis of Nutrition and Metabolism in 2019. Thank you very much.